Good morning. Welcome all of you this morning to our worship service uh, here at First Baptist Church in Lexington, Mississippi. Welcome those of you who are worshiping with us online as well. In the way of announcements, notice in your bulletin that uh, everything is back on again. So tomorrow at 11.45, we will begin our Monday Bible studies in person again in the Fellowship Hall, uh, our Bible study with a meal. So I hope you make plans to come and be there. We'll continue our online study on Tuesdays at 11. And then Wednesday at 5.30, we have our choir rehearsal. So if any of you've got a, a singing voice you'd like to blend with ours and would like to come join with us, we would really welcome you to come be part of the choir. Are there any other announcements? Lord, we know that as your people, we are called to so much. 
and that the need around us is so great. We know, too, that your spirit, your power, and the gifts you offer us are more than sufficient. So help us, Lord, to be willing and courageous disciples as we take what you give us and use it to glorify you in our work as kingdom builders. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that we have received at your hand. We thank you for lives that have been touched and prayers that have been answered. And we continue, Lord, to lift before you those who are sick, praying for their healing, those who grieve, Father, that through your powerful presence they would find comfort and hope for the days ahead. And we continue, Lord, to open ourselves to you so that we may shine brightly as lights and beacons of hope to draw others into your presence as we continue to serve. And so now, as we worship together in spirit and in truth, we lift before you, Father, the petition your Son taught all his disciples to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn is Come Christians Join to Sing. Number 77 in our hymnals here. <laughs>
Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the 24th chapter of Luke, beginning with verse 13 and reading through verse 43. Now behold, two of the disciples were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, so that they did not know him. And Jesus said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are so sad? Then one of the disciples, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and to crucify him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But the disciples constrained him, saying, Please abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And Jesus went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then these two disciples told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marvel, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. The word of God for the people of God. Praise God. Please be seated. This wonderful account of these two disciples walking that seven miles to Emmaus on the Sunday afternoon of Jesus' resurrection is a story that holds us because we can relate to what these two disciples are dealing with. We can relate to the emotions that are boiling within them as they travel on the road. In fact, in a way, it is our story. Indeed, it's been suggested by other preachers for many years that 
Maybe Luke did not name that other disciple, not because he didn't know who it was, but perhaps because he wanted to leave a place for us to be able to insert ourselves in the narrative. That it was Cleopas and Beverly walking the road to Emmaus. That it was Cleopas and Jack on the road to Emmaus. It's our story because it describes so often our own situations and spiritual dilemmas that happen at different times in our lives. So let's walk with them for just a moment. And what an experience those two disciples had been through. What a week it had been, beginning with the triumphal entry just a week before. And as they walked along the road, they talked about all these things that had happened over the last eight days. The crowd cheering in joyful celebration as Jesus entered Jerusalem. How he had driven the sacrificial animals out of the temple and overturned the money changers' table. Then there were the teachings in the temple, the wonderful parables. They remembered him cursing that fig tree. And then the feast of the Passover where Jesus broke the bread and told them, this is my body that is broken for you. And as he passed the cup of wine, he said, this is my blood that has been shed for you. They still didn't understand that. But then everything had gone terribly wrong. They grieved as they discussed the Lord's betrayal by Judas, one of them, that Thursday night. And then Jesus' horrible scourging and crucifixion on Friday. All their dream, all their hopes that he would have been the Messiah to free Israel from bondage were gone. And now these astonishing tales that the women had come in early that morning telling them that, that they had seen angels who told them that Jesus was alive. How was that possible? The more they talked about it, the more confused, the more depressed, the more saddened they became. And so here they are, taking the road out of Jerusalem toward that little village of Emmaus. And Luke doesn't tell us why specifically they took the trip. Maybe they needed to have time just to, to walk and, and talk together about all of these things. Maybe they needed to, to get away from Jerusalem, from all of the, the rumors, the drama, all the confusion, just put a little distance between themselves and all the hubbub. It could be that one or both of the disciples lived there in Emmaus since they went straight to a house where no one else was staying. The bottom line is that Emmaus was their escape plan. This was their time to get away. Their safe haven where they could escape pressures and dangers of Jerusalem and just Try to rest. Just try to wrap their minds around what was going on. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like that? Have you ever been so confused, so sad, or fearful, or shocked at what you were experiencing that you just had to get away? The truth is we all have, and we all need that space from time to time. We all need to have an Emmaus where we can escape to and sort out the worrisome, the problematic things in our life. Sometimes we just need to get out from under the pressure for a while. A place to set aside all the, all the responsibilities and just be. And for us, as God's people, to do as God told us and just be still. Let our spirits calm and know that God is near and that he loves us. Your Emmaus may just be some particular place in your house where you can go and, and be by yourself. It could be the workshop up on the hill or, or the hunting camp, a cabin on a lake or, or a retreat in the mountains. It could even be a destination in another state, another country, whatever it takes for you. Because the bottom line is that, that it's anywhere that gives us space. 
space from the confusion and the pressure and the stress of your situation and allows you room to breathe and to reflect. Emmaus is where we go to to revive ourselves, where we can let our batteries recharge and just let it all go. It's a place of renewal. And I have a feeling that's why Cleopas and the other disciple were traveling there on that Sunday afternoon. They needed time to renew. They needed time to, to grieve. They needed to leave all the craziness behind. Take some time to themselves. But they weren't the only travelers on that road out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been packed to overflowing for the celebration of the Passover. And now pilgrims were making their way out of Jerusalem back to their homes. Some to faraway places they had come from just to be in Jerusalem for that holiest of Jewish celebrations. And many of them were taking that same road out of Jerusalem that led past Emmaus that our two disciples are walking. And it just so happened that one of those traveling that road had been walking right along beside Cleopas and his companion. Had been listening to their conversation and now he speaks up, asking what they were talking about causing them such sadness and, and consternation. Cleopas was astounded that anyone could have been in Jerusalem this Passover and not known what had happened. How could he not have heard of that wonderful parade, the excitement the people felt when Jesus came into Jerusalem? How had he not heard of the temple being cleansed? Or how Jesus had famously backed down the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and the scribes to the people's relief and joy? How could he not know how he had been betrayed by one of his own and then crucified. But the stranger was more knowledgeable than Cleopas about what responsibilities Messiah actually had. And so he began to explain all those prophecies to them, starting with Moses, one by one. And of course, he was no stranger at all, but was the risen Lord. Jesus himself explained to his disciples why he did what he did, why the things happened the way that they happened. And so when they get to Emmaus, they, they are so enraptured by this great truths that Jesus has revealed to them that they compel him to stay because he makes to travel on down the road. Remember that passage of scripture that says, to always welcome a stranger because you never know when you may be entertaining an angel unaware. Well, they were entertaining Christ himself, though they didn't know it at the moment. And so he came in, he stayed, and then at the table in a moment so familiar to them, so intimate, especially since that last supper to them, as Jesus thanked the Father for the food and blessed the bread and broke it and handed it to them. They immediately knew who he was. They realized who was before them. And he vanished and was gone. How could they have misrecognized him, they asked each other. Well, the answer is the same way we fail to recognize Jesus day after day in our own lives. As he walks with us, as he talks with us trying to help us understand and make sense out of whatever it is we're going through. Whatever troubles we're facing, whatever hurt or fear we have, Jesus has the answer because Jesus is the answer. He can take all that is causing our worry and give us such a new understanding that our situation is not only made bearable, but he turns it into a blessing. That's what he did for Cleopas and his companion as they walked along the road and then as they sat at the table that afternoon. He turned all of their fear, their anxiety, and their sadness 
into joy. They weren't confused anymore about what had happened in Jerusalem or why Jesus had been crucified because he had explained it all to them. And now they knew he was alive. He had risen indeed just like the women had told them that morning and their exuberance was so great that they could not put off till the next morning going back to Jerusalem, making that return trip uphill to the city. They had to get back on the road within the hour to get back to the other disciples and witness to what they had seen and heard. When was the last time you experienced anything like that? When is the last time that you experienced Jesus breaking bread with you? When was the last time you opened your own heart to his words of hope, of peace, of forgiveness, his teachings of grace, so that you could have your joy restored? Sometimes I think that we as Jesus' disciples today can be even more foolish and slow of heart to believe what the Gospels tell us than those companions on the road to Emmaus that day. Because if we weren't, we would be living lives of joyful obedience, walking with our spiritual eyes and ears wide open as we recognize Jesus along the way during our walk, as we listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us in our hearts. We would hear his encouragement when we began to feel doubtful or useless. We would hear his warnings when we are allowing ourselves to be tempted to venture outside the will of God. We would hear his instructions on how to heal ourselves, our families, our communities. We would hear words of comfort and hope in the midst of our grief. If we were not so slow of heart to believe the promises of Jesus, church, we would be bursting out in praise and worship wherever we were, day after day. We would push other things aside and make time for holy conversation in prayer with our risen Lord. And we would take the time to meditate on his word as we studied it as though our eternal lives depended on it. Because they do. Maybe it's been too long since we traveled to Emmaus ourselves. Maybe we should take that road, get out of the rat race for a few hours, a few days, and make time for reflection. I challenge you to revive yourselves. Throw open the door to your mind and your heart and make time for reflection. Make room for Christ. Let the Holy Spirit breathe new life into your own spirit. And if you become stale or, or lukewarm, then let Jesus remove the callous that's hardened your heart so you can feel it beating again to the rhythm of his own. Then you will experience anew the excitement, the spiritual energy you felt when you first gave your heart to Christ. That's what we all need. That Emmaus Road experience when we suddenly realize that Jesus is really, truly alive. And that he is really, truly our risen Lord and Savior. And we have to go and tell others about the wonderful joy of knowing Christ. The wonderful peace and strength that we gain. The freedom from fear and worry that is ours because we know whom we have believed. And we know he has the power and the will to do everything in our lives that he promised to do. When was the last time you felt like that? When was the last time you couldn't wait until the next day to go tell somebody the good news? Maybe you need to go to Emmaus not out of anxiety or confusion, but dare I say it, maybe some of us need to go to Emmaus because we've become spiritually lazy. 
Maybe we become so comfortable in our present place that we just want to stay there. Don't rock the boat. Just let everything keep coasting along the way it is with our spirituality. But church, we are called to grow in the spirit, not to stay the same, not to stagnate, not to become lukewarm. We can't remain babies in the faith and we can't get to the stage of adolescent spiritual growth and then just stop. Neither of those levels of spiritual faith can survive the war that is being waged against us as God's people. And make no mistake about it, you are in a desperate battle for your spiritual eternity, for your soul. And here's the thing, all you have to do is act. All you have to do is act and you win. Christ has promised that. He's already defeated our enemy. And he has poured the Holy Spirit out to anyone who will receive it. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We need to remember that, church. The only time we lose is when we aren't fighting, when we aren't praying, when we aren't studying, when we aren't seeking God's will and acting on that will. And we never, ever go this course alone. Jesus is always beside us, whatever road, whatever path of life we find ourselves on, never leaving us, never forsaking us, never for one moment are you outside of your Father's thoughts and love. Don't ignore what Christ is offering you. Listen, learn, and love. Take his words to heart and experience the strength of spirit that will forge your character into his likeness. Act on his words and you will find the faith that will overcome all the weapons of the enemy and will fill your life with such purpose and joy that others will want to know what's gotten into you. And you can tell them, Jesus has gotten into me. The Holy Spirit has gotten into me. And let me tell you what it will do for you. That's how we witness. That's how we build the kingdom. It's time we look up from the dusty roads and the, the problems surrounding us and pay attention to who is walking that road beside us. He's waiting for us even now, offering to take the burden from your shoulders, to remove the anxiety from your mind and to cast the fear from your heart. All you have to do is follow it. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about what you've done or what you've left undone. Just come as you are and open your heart and mind to the giver of life. Don't let doubts arise in your heart about whether God loves you enough to save you. Jesus showed you that love on the cross many, many years ago. The perfect Lamb of God who was your sacrifice and who now offers you freedom and peace. Don't put it off. Don't wait for a better day or a better time because there isn't one. Your redemption is here and now. Embrace it and let Christ embrace you. It's not all about that walk down to Emmaus. It's really about that joyful experience of running back to Jerusalem to tell them we have seen the Lord and he is alive. Our closing hymn is 119. We're doing something different this morning, so we will sing verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6. First two and last two. Will you stand as we sing? Thou bids me 
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.